Okay, people, we are continuing on with our adventures in food labeling. And uh, those of you who are following along with the Nutrition for Food Technology course, you have been working on some projects in ASHA. And you'll notice in ASHA that the ingredient declaration that's provided has a lot of weird and wonderful anomalies. I, I recall when we were doing the banana milkshake, the ingredient declaration would say, banana, medium seven inches long and you're like that's not how it would look if it was on the package as a food technologist you are going to be developing new products but part of that is that you will have the responsibility of helping develop the label copy that then goes to the design team and you as the product developer need to be able to make a, a compliant ingredient declaration for your food product now this is also going to progress because as we are making these compliant um, ingredient declarations, we will be able to then start to make judgment calls if we can make health claims on this product. And so it's all adding up to that uh, bigger picture thing that we're, we're leading to uh, closer to midterm. So today we're going to look at some of the regulations behind ingredient declarations on food packages. And at the end of this video, you'll be able to create a basic ingredient declaration based on a percent weight of ingredients within a product. You'll apply component labeling to ingredients, apply sugars grouping within the labeling, and identify which ingredients are exempt from the component labeling. Now, we're going to be thinking really on a theory basis, but it's going to be pretty self-evident how you're applying this within the edits. And I'll, I'll walk you through in a second video on how to do some of these functional changes within your ESHA label. So, as we have said before, we are working for the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, which is a document provided by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And I want to just keep reinforcing and encouraging you to go back, read along with the guide, because as much as I'm saying stuff that I have pulled directly from this guide. This guide is a living, breathing document, and there are constant changes being made to the document. In the past 10 years that I've been teaching this course, we have seen changes to how allergens are labeled. We are seeing changes about um, what is declared on a nutrition facts table, and um, we're seeing how sugars are now being grouped in different uh, forms and structures to help the consumers identify when sugars are being added to a food product. And so as much as I want you to have a really strong sense of how this happens, and obviously memorization is a good thing, at the same time, I really want to encourage you to always go back to the source document and do the cross-referencing and double check and triple check to make sure that everything that you are applying to your label is indeed how it is at the time that you're doing your, 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 um, product development, because honestly, the rules will change. If you know how to look up the rules, that is never going to change. You know how to research, you know how to define your information, you know how to um, apply regulatory guidance appropriately. And so when the rules change, you will be able to keep changing along with it. And that's a really good innovation skill set. So do take the time to follow along with us. So what products need an ingredient label, well, uh, for the most part, all prepackaged products with more than one ingredient must declare their ingredients. So yesterday, for example, I was, I was playing around in some graphic software with my teenage kid because she's really into um, computer programming. And I said, try something out. And I, and I drew a box of carrots. And she says, carrots don't need an ingredient label, mom. And she was right. Products that do not have more than one ingredient must declare those ingredients and components. And what do I mean by a component? Well, a component is an ingredient that has ingredients. And that is a really um, simple way of putting it. Now, there are certain products that are exempt. And so we'll, we'll jump into some of those exemptions in a moment here. But uh, ingredients on these ingredient lists are declared by their common name. So I mentioned in Esha, oftentimes they're using the database value as the name of the ingredient. 
And that database value isn't a common name or plain language name. So I use the example, the banana. The banana came out as banana, medium, seven inches long. We don't need to put that. We just need to put banana. In other cases, it was milk, 2%, with added vitamin A and D. We don't need to put that. We just can put milk. And we'll talk about some of the exemptions to the components in a, in a little bit. You don't need to add additional peripheral information unless it's necessary to differentiate that ingredient. So if you have things like organic or, um, or so on, that you can add that on a voluntary basis. Plant sources need to be on those um, ingredients that have derivatives. So starches, oils, and protein isolates, you do need to label the plant source. So pea protein, cornstarch. Uh, it was only a few years ago that you could just put in protein isolate and not label the plant source or the origin. And based off of uh, feedback from consumers and especially the allergen community, it was really important for the manufacturing sector to start labeling the plant source itself, or in, in some cases, the animal source of different derivative ingredients. Now, there are exceptions, or pardon me, exemptions on certain products that don't need to declare ingredients. So some foods that are pre-packed and packaged at retail in a bulk form. So um, for example, you're going to the bulk barn and they have some pre-packaged products in there that uh, you can grab and go. Those do not require an ingredient declaration. Now, What's interesting is that it doesn't apply to mixed nuts, it doesn't apply to uncured meat, and it doesn't apply to poultry. And this is really fascinating because when they say, well, uncured meat and poultry, you may be saying, well, wait a second, isn't that a single ingredient product? Not always. And, in, and, and so again, many of the uh, cuts of meat that you see in the grocery retail, they have been they aren't single ingredient products. In some cases, they have salts, they have phosphates, they have other um, pumping agents to increase the moisture. And as such, it is important to be labeling that when you're putting it up against a competitive product. Pre-packed individual portions of foods for restaurants and airlines do not require ingredients. Commissary products. So if you're at a central commissary or catering facility and you're making foods for mobile canteens or vending machines, those don't require ingredients. Prepacked meat that is roasted on premises. So think of rotisserie chickens. Those do not require ingredients. And standardized alcoholic beverages and vinegars. Now, we will talk at a later point about what is a standardized product, but more or less it means that in the food and drugs regulation, there is a standard of identity for that product. And it just means that governments um, around the world have set a declaration on what that product should be. I realize that chocolate does declare its ingredients, but chocolate's a good example. I'm sure you've had um, cookies covered with a chocolatey flavored coating. Well, that is not chocolate. And, and to be able to call it chocolate, you have to meet the standard of identity. In the case of standardized alcoholic beverages, where it meets the standard of identity, exactly what ingredients and what composition is, is there, you do not require an ingredient declaration. Also the same with standardized vinegars, but non-standardized products do require ingredient labeling. So let's say you were in the, I don't know, you were making vodka, but then you were making vodka with, with uh, all sorts of different plant extractives, and maybe you were adding floating chocolate chips inside of it. Now suddenly you, it is not meeting the standard of identity and you would require an ingredient declaration on that product. What more? Oh my gosh, this it, it just keeps going on and on. So when you're declaring your ingredients, you're going to list them by descending order by weight. And so this is one other reason I know in some of the earlier slideshows, I kept harping on how important it is to weigh out your ingredients and weigh them out accurately and document them in a spreadsheet form. Now, if you're working in ESHA, you've likely discovered that there's also a spreadsheet form in there that takes your ingredients that you've added and will sort them by weight as well. But you have to declare those ingredients by descending order weight. And when you 
say, well, where do I take that weight? Do I take it as an as received, as prepared? Can I do some yield adjustment based off of dehydration during the process? It is considered the right before adding to the mixing bowl. And when when we say that as a regulatory guidance, it just means that you you can't manipulate your weights based off of trim weights or peel weights, and you can't manipulate it for processing losses or yield losses during processing. And so you have to think about it as just before added to the mixing bowl. That said, don't think a mixing bowl like in the kitchen. Think think like this lady is standing next to a mixing bowl. This is a large industrial mixer. And indeed, you have to think at what point am I adding it to the mix of the food product? Some things can be manipulated though within that order of operations. So you may have noticed on a lot of the food products that you eat, the spices are often the last ingredient or natural and artificial flavors are almost always the last ingredient. And honestly, there's a reason why it is some, uh, some ingredients can be moved to the bottom end of the list. And part of it is for trade protection. So you may have noticed that when, in the case of spices, seasonings, and herbs, you do not have to, um, you do not have to isolate them out. So let's say you're making a spice cookie, you do not have to list cinnamon, ginger, cardamom, anise seeds, and so when you can group it all together. The same with herbs, and that is partly so that, um, think of the KFC secret blend of 11 herbs and spices. You don't have to declare every single individual spice and herb, except in the case of mustard, because that's an allergen. And onions and garlic are not considered spices and herbs. So they have to be pulled out as, as separate ingredients. So if it's if, if you've got garlic powder in a uh, spice mix, you have to pull that out as a separate, in, uh, as a separate ingredient. Um, Salt has to be declared by its appropriate weight. So you can't bury salt at the very end of your uh, ingredient list. If salt is an ingredient there in larger proportion than your spices or other ingredients, it has to be listed as such. Natural and artificial flavors can go to the end. Flavor enhancers, and that would include things like monosodium glutamate or um, hydrolyzed plant proteins. Food additives. And this is where it's weird, except ingredients of food additive preparations or mixtures of substances for use as a food additive. Now, what does that mean? Food additives, in some cases, food additives have their own ingredients. And the, uh, in many cases, those um, ingredients do not require additional declaration. Vitamins and salts or derivatives of vitamins and mineral nutrients and their salts. They can also go to the end of a ingredient list because they're usually there in small quantity. Um, but uh, some of those ingredients can go to the end and are not required to be in there by, by order. However, there's nothing wrong with you putting them in an actual weight order. It's just the convention that has been in place for many, many years. Some things do not have to be declared. And again, this is pulled directly from that guidance document, but wax coatings on fruits and vegetables. I put a turnip here because turnips are very commonly coated in wax. Um, sausage casings do not require declaration. Modified atmosphere packaging gases do not require declaration. And manufacturing and processing aids. And when it comes to defining what a processing aid is, um, I realize you may or may not have done this in your HACCP class, but a processing aid is an ingredient that does not remain in the final product. So for example, let's say you're using a non-stick spray on a grill or in a loaf pan, or maybe you're using an enzyme to clarify some juice. It's considered that that enzyme gets denatured and does not exist in the final product. In the case of that non-stick spray on your loaf pan, it's considered that the residual on that is minimal. And so these processing aids do not have to be declared unless there's an allergen component, and then you do have to declare because of that allergen potentially causing cross-contamination in the product. Sugars. Oh my gosh, this is a whole soap opera in its own right. This only changed a couple of years ago, but uh, sugars and caloric sweeteners are grouped together under a heading sugars and then bracket with the sugar ingredients in there by declining weight. And uh, the nice thing is Esha will help you do that 
The problem is that you need to be really paying attention because Escher won't tell you if your ingredient is there for the purposes of sweeten or if your ingredient is there for the purposes of characterizing the product. And so honey, maple syrup, fruit juices, this is, the, this is where the, the confusion can come. Fruit juices and fruit purees in particular. Agave syrup, rice syrup, corn syrup, those are pretty clear cut that those are sugars. But in the case of fruit juices and fruit purees, that's where the industry, uh, the industry sort of uh, got the, their, mo their own self in trouble because um, things like taking apple juice concentrate and using what was called decharacterized apple juice concentrate, where they had stripped it from much of its flavor and acid, people were calling it, well, apple juice concentrate. And, and people out shopping, looking at those ingredient declarations are saying, oh, well, this has apple juice. That, that's a good serving of fruits and that must be good for me. But meanwhile, all of the good stuff had been stripped and it was just the sugar that was left from the apple juice concentrate. So many of these fruit juices or fruit purees are suspect by the inspection agency. And as such, you do need to be paying attention to make sure that if you've got that in your product, is it a characterizing ingredient? So for example, let's make, let's say you're making yogurt with um, blueberry puree on the bottom. The blueberry puree is there for the purposes of making your yogurt taste like blueberries. It is not there for the purposes of being a sugar substitute. And so you do need to be ready to back yourself up if you choose to not put something into that sugars list. Now, we mentioned components before. Components are ingredients that have ingredients. So let's say we're at a frozen pizza company. Let's say Dr. Edgar in London, Ontario, and you are making pizza. Well, you have certain ingredients that have ingredients. So our pepperoni has ingredients, maybe pork, beef, um, salts, uh, flavoring agents, spices, etc. Maybe our cheese has different ingredients. Um, maybe our tomato sauce has different ingredients. You would take each of those core ingredients and then you would put the ingredients of your ingredients, otherwise known as your components, and put those in bracket after the name of the ingredient. So in the case of our pizza, you would have dough pizza or, or pizza crust, and then it would be bracket the ingredients for your dough, wheat flour, water, yeast, salt, etc. Same deal with your pepperoni, same deal with your tomato sauce, and quite likely same deal with your cheese. Now, there are certain exemptions. Cheese sometimes, sometimes with a big asterisk is exempted from this. So, oh, some component labeling is exempt. And this is my, oh, <laughs> I wrote here, are you having fun yet? So some components, let's say, let's say you had, I don't know, a, an ingredient, uh, I, maybe you're making cookies and you've got butter in there. Do you have to put butter and then the ingredients of your butter? No, in this case, you can, you can say butter is a standardized ingredient. Same with margarine, you may have different ingredients within your margarine. If your product is indeed a standardized margarine, you do not have to put the components down. Whole wheat flour or wheat flour, and I often see students do this where they'll be like, enriched wheat flour, and then they'll do brackets, wheat flour, and all of the different fortificants, and then all of the different um, bleaching aids and process or different uh, dough conditioning aids that are in that flour. You do not have to do that for flour. All sorts of different ingredients are in that exempted list. And this is, again, one of those reasons why I stress that it's important to go back and refer to those common lists time and time again when doing labeling. Because if you're, if you're going to try and take advantage of different exemptions, you want to make sure that you are truly interpreting it correctly. Oh my gosh, some more things that are exempt from component labeling. So bread, if your bread meets the compositional standards in B, uh, B13, if your uh, milk, if it meets the compositional standards in B08 of the Food and Drugs Regulation, sweetening agents with compositional standards B18 section, vinegars, alcoholic beverages, cheeses, if, it's le if it meets the standard of identity and it is less than 10% of the packaged product. So my pizza, for example, if my pizza was standardized mozzarella cheese and it was less than 10% of the weight of the pizza, then I do not have to put 
the components of my cheese. But if it's more than 10% of my uh, the weight of the pizza, then I do have to put the components of the cheese. Jams and jellies. As long as they meet the compositional standards set out in the Food and Drugs Regulation, and as long as they are less than 5% of the, the product. So maybe I've got a tiny dab of jam on a cookie. I might be able to get away with it, but if it's a if it's a jam tart and it's greater than 5%, then I do need to put the ingredients. Olives, pickles, relish, horseradishes, as long as it's less than 10%. Different uh, vegetable oils or animal fats, as long as it is less than 15%. Preserved and prepared fish, uh, fish meat, poultry meat, meat byproducts, etc. So again, I could go back to my pizza. If my pepperoni was less than 10%, then I don't have to. Here's the thing, on these things that it says it's exempt, you still can put your ingredients or components on there. And what we're finding is that customers really value transparency in the process. And oftentimes when companies say, well, we wanna keep our ingredient label really, really clean. The big challenge is that uh, it's, it's becoming easier and easier for consumers to find out what's going on in different food products. And the last thing you need is, as a company is to be accused of not being transparent. And so if you are focused on using all of these different exemptions, do be prepared that people may push back and say, well, I want to know what's in my product. There's no way that uh, they will push back. Let's say you're at that frozen pizza company and you say clean label pizza and you're putting your cheese at less than 10%, therefore you don't have to put ingredients, you're putting your meat at less than 10%, so you don't have to put your components. Some consumers are gonna push back and say, there can't, like, there's gotta be ingredients in there. Be prepared for consumer complaints. Be prepared for that because um, people want that level of transparency. Anyways, I can't stress this enough. I want you to see the big picture in this entire process because Honestly, you have to go back to that document and all of these exemptions, I guarantee you in a year or two, they're all going to change. Oh, here's another example of fun with components, prepackaged sandwiches. So if you're making a sandwich and it's made with bread, then you don't have to have component labeling on any of the ingredients. You only have to have, you have to have the, a listing of the ingredients, but not the components. And you do have to have the allergen label. And this includes alternative breads. And this, this is a, it's a hilarious story here, but you can't do it for open face sandwiches. So you can't make a flatbread. You can't make a pizza. You can't make a tuna melt. You can't make a s'more broth. You, it only works for sandwiches that completely enrobe the fillings. And you can't do it for alternative sandwiches like ice cream sandwiches or donut sandwiches. And it doesn't count for other starch wrapped ingredients such as dumplings and pizza pops. And as such, I can't stress this enough. Uh, all of these exemptions are all fine and good. When in doubt, declare your components because honestly, uh, honesty <laughs> and transparency are incredibly important to consumers. Oh, here's another one. I put a picture of bread pudding. Let's say you were making bread pudding and bread was your uh, dominant source of fortification because bread, as you know, has to be made with enriched, or it doesn't have to be, but it is commonly made with enriched wheat flour and that contains added vitamins and minerals. Let's say you had this bread pudding and you decide based off of your nutrition facts that you want to make a, a excellent source of folate because there's lots of bread in there and the bread was fortified with folate and that fortification is the dominant source of the folate. Now, if you recall, that list said bread didn't require its component labeling, but because we have made a health claim, now all of the exceptions are off and we have to label all of the components in that recipe. Because we made a health claim and it was because we took advantage of an exemption that we were burying where that health claim came from. Some food preparations, and, and I'm using the term deliberately here, are exhibit 
or exempt, pardon me, from component labeling. So food coloring, food flavorings, certain spice mixtures, seasoning mixtures, vitamin preparations, mineral preparations, oftentimes they will have other uh, ingredients. So for example, perhaps you've got this yellow food coloring and the dominant yellow coloring agent would be tartrazine. Um, there may be some FD or Allure Red in there. I was going to say FDNC, but that's an American term. Um, but let's say it's tartrazine and Allure Red in there, but there may be other things like propylene glycol or um, ethyl alcohol or uh, different stabilizing agents, maybe sodium benzoate, uh, potass uh, potassium sorbate. Anyways, you can just call it food coloring. You don't have to go in and label all of the different components within it. Other food additives, rennet, and when we say food additives, it would imply that it is in the list of incorporation that uh, was derived historically from um, the Division 16 of the Food and Drugs Regulation. But the lists of incorporation are the official lists of food additives that uh, Health Canada uh, regulate. So all of these uh, different components or different ingredients do not require component labeling. Now, some things that you can't bury in a component list and must be declared, things like salt, glutamic acids, monosodium glutamate, hydrolyzed plant proteins, aspartame and non-nutritive sweeteners, so sucralose, uh, saccharin, and so on, potassium chloride, and uh, this, this last one, this one drives me crazy. Any ingredient or component that performs a function or has any effect on that food in the final form. And for me, as a food chemist, this, this statement doesn't really make sense. But what they mean is, if that ingredient confers over, let's say it's within a, an ingredient and you've got a component in there, if it confers that same effect from the sub-ingredient to the final product, then it's supposed to be pulled forward if it's, if it's on a list that you can't be burying it. So they use the example of if you are using a lemon flavoring, and that lemon flavoring has a yellow coloring in it, let's say tartrazine. Tartrazine is a very common artificial yellow. And then your final product has an abnormally yellow color to it because of that lemon flavoring. You need to say, well, that ingredient performed a function in the final form product and therefore declare the tartrazine in the product. Now, if you had that lemon flavoring and you were adding it at such a low level that the tartrazine was not apparent, then in theory, you do not have to label the components. Oh, other things that you must declare, peanuts. So if you have a derivative of peanuts, then you must declare it. And so you can't bury it in your components and then find an exemption. So peanut oil, hydrogenated peanut oil, partially hydrogenated peanut oil, and modified peanut oil all must be declared. I can't stress this enough, when in doubt, refer back to your source. And the guide to food labeling for industry is constantly changing. It is constantly being upgraded. There's now an AI chat box that you're, you're supposed to be able to ask questions to. I can't stress enough how important it is to read this and review it, but mostly just to get used to working with it and being able to look this stuff up really, really quickly. The, the more familiar you become with the document, the faster you'll be able to quickly look this stuff up and reassure yourself as you're doing your product development that you're making your declarations correctly. All right, I think that is it. And so those of you who are working on different ESHA projects, have some fun with this and really think about how you are making your ingredient declaration on your food products. All right, take care and we'll talk to you soon.